Hey kids. Okay, this is our next read aloud for the Revolutionary War unit from Houghton Mifflin Reading. This is the old program that we no longer have in our classrooms. Therefore, uh, a lot of you guys won't have this at home, but I still feel like the stories in it are worth revisiting, especially now because it gives us a great look at how to compare and contrast some of the characters that we've been reading about. So in my class, uh, we were working on this, and it's kind of a super fancy Venn diagram about Paul Revere, a patriot point of view, uh, Katie's trunk, that's the previous video that I recorded, which is a loyalist or Tory point of view, and then James Fortin, which is today. Now this story is a little bit longer, so I'm going to get started reading. This excerpt is James Fortin, and it, you can tell it's an excerpt because it says, from the longer story, now is your time. Okay, so this is the front of the cover of the longer book, and I would highly recommend that for anyone who's interested. Uh, the author is Walter Dean Myers, and I'm going to uh, just show you the pictures here and the illustrator, Leonard Jenkins. And so the pictures always are worth a thousand words, so we're going to go ahead and uh, start this. And think about it, um, James Fortin served on a ship during the Revolution. As you read, think of questions to discuss with classmates about his experiences. So kind of enjoy the pictures. I'll try to show you the text. Um, it's always awkward with this, this little thing that's kind of in the way. If I should do it this way, it's really awkward. So I'm going to show you the pictures and then I'll just show you the words real quick so that I can read and then you guys can think about the pictures, okay? All right. It was early morning on Tuesday, September 2nd, 1766, in the city of Philadelphia. The roads into the city were already filling with farmers bringing in produce to sell. Windows in the city were coming alive with the glow of lamplight. Small factory owners trudged through the winding streets to small shops. Printers, shoemakers, blacksmiths, candle makers, bakers, all began the business of the day. For Philadelphia was indeed a city of business. As day broke over the harbor, the masts of the ships loomed against the gray skies. The ships rocked at their moorings as if they too were ready for the new day. Hundreds of free men of African descent lived in Philadelphia. The city was the home of a number of noted abolitionists, people who wanted to abolish or do away with the practice of slavery, including the Quakers, a powerful and influential religious group. More important was the fact that Africans could find work in Philadelphia. Many of the Africans worked the docks, loading and unloading the ships that brought products to the colonies from all over the world. I'll show you the words here. Others were tradesmen and seamstresses, cooks, barbers, and common laborers. All along the eastern seaboard from Baltimore to New England, free Africans worked on boats, hauling loads, carrying passengers, and fishing. Many opened restaurants, Others bought their own boats and tried their luck on the brisk waterfronts. And so just real quick, words in case you have to go back with comprehension questions and words. And you can always pause it on those pictures or on that still so that you can see what it's saying. Now this has a lot of words, as you can see. And if you need to pause it so that you can quote from the text, you go right ahead. But watch this while I read. Thomas Fortin, a free African, was employed by Robert Bridges, a sailmaker in Philadelphia. Sailmaking was a profitable but difficult job. Sewing the coarse cloth was brutal on the hands. The heavy thread had to be waxed and handled with dexterity. Dexterity is like really good with your hands. A person trying to break the thread with his hands could see it cut through his flesh like a knife. But Fortin appreciated his job. It paid reasonably well, and the work was steady. 
Fortin helped in all aspects of sailmaking and assisted in installing the sails on the ships the firm serviced. With the income from his work, he had purchased his wife's freedom. Now on this day, Tuesday morning, sorry, now on this early Tuesday morning, a new baby was due. The baby, born later that day, was James Fortin. Young James Fortin's early life was not that different from that of other poor children living in Philadelphia. He played marbles and blind man's bluff, and he raced in the streets. When he was old enough, he would go down to the docks to see the ships. Sometimes James went to the shop where his father worked and did odd jobs. Bridges liked him and let him work as much as he could, but he also encouraged Thomas Fortin to make sure that his son learned to read and write. The Fortins sent their son to the small school that had been created for African children by a Quaker, Anthony Benezet. He believed that the only way the Africans would ever take a meaningful place in the colonies would be through education. Thomas Fortin was working on a ship when he fell to his death. James Fortin was only seven at the time. His mother was devastated, but still insisted that her son continue school. He did so for two more years, after which he took a job working in a small store. Now note there, if he died when his, uh, he died and James is only seven, and then he goes to school for two more years, he's only nine, and then he starts working in a small store. So things are really different, okay? Take yourself out of our modern times and think about how families lived. What James wanted to do was to go to sea. He was 14 in 1781 when his mother finally relented and gave her permission. America was fighting for its freedom, and James Fortin would be fighting too. He knew about the difficulties between the British and the American colonists. He had seen he had seen first British soldiers and then American soldiers marching through the streets of Philadelphia. Among the American soldiers were men of color. A black child in Philadelphia in the 1700s had to be careful. There were stories of free Africans being kidnapped and sold into slavery. He had seen the captives on the ships. They looked like him. The same dark skin, the same wide nose, but there was a sadness about them that both touched his heart and frightened him. He had seen Africans in chains being marched through the streets on their way to the south. He never forgot the sight of his people in bondage or accepted it as natural that black people should be slaves. But the black soldiers Fortin saw were something special marching with muskets on their shoulders, they seemed taller and blacker than any men he had ever seen. And there were African sailors too. He knew some of these men. They had been fishermen and haulers before the conflict with Great Britain. Now they worked on privateers and Navy ships. Sometimes he heard talk about naval battles and he tried to imagine what they must have been like. words in case you need it for later in the picture. In the summer of 1781, James Fortin signed on to the privateer Royal Lewis, commanded by Stephen Decatur Sr. The colonies had few ships of their own to fight against the powerful British Navy and issued letters of mark to private parties. These allowed the ships under the flag of the United States to attack British ships and to profit from the sale of any vessel captured. The Royal Lewis sailed out of Philadelphia in August and was quickly engaged by the British vessel Active, a heavy armed brig sent from England to protect its trade ships. The Royal Lewis's guns were loaded with gunpowder that was tamped down by an assistant gunner. 
Then the cannonball was put into a, the barrel and pushed against the powder. Then the powder would be ignited. The powder had to be kept had to be kept below decks in case of a hit by an enemy ship. Now this paragraph, there may be some questions about the order of loading a cannon. Fortin's job was to carry the powder from below to the guns. Up and down the stairs he raced with the powder as shots from the British ship whistled overhead. There were large holes in the sails and men screaming as they were hit with grape shot that splintered the sides of the ship. The smell of gunpowder filled the air as Captain Decatur turned his ship to keep his broadside guns trained on the active. Sailors all about Fortin were falling, some dying, even as others cried for more powder. Again he went below decks, knowing that if a shot ripped through to the powder kegs or if any of the burning planks fell down into the hold, he would be killed instantly in the explosion. Up he came again with as much powder as he could carry. After what must have seemed forever with the two ships tacking about each other like angry cats, tacking about is like you're going like this, you keep facing off, tacking about each other like angry cats, the active lowered its flag. It had surrendered. Decatur brought his ship into Philadelphia, its guns still trained on the limping active. The crowd on the dock cheered, cheered wildly as they recognized the American flag on the Royal Lewis. On board the victorious ship, James Fortin had mixed feelings as he saw so many of his comrades wounded, some mortally. That means many people died. And so they're victorious, and so they're cheering, and everybody's like, yay! But people died, so that that's a horrible um, mix of feelings all roiling around inside you. The Royal Lewis turned its prisoners over to the military authorities. On the 27th of September, the active was sold. The proceeds were split among the owners of the Royal Lewis and the crew. The sailors with the wor worst wounds were sent off to be cared for. The others, their own wounds treated, were soon about the business of repairing the ship. Fortin must have been excited. Once the fear of the battle had subsided and the wounded were taken off, it was easy to think about the dangerous encounter in terms of adventure. And they had won. The missing crew was replaced. <laughs> missing crew, well, the people who were injured and killed. The ship was checked carefully by its captain and found to be in fine fighting condition. The crew carried more ammunition aboard, more powder, and fresh provisions. Once more, they sailed for open waters. On the 16th of October, 1781, they sighted a ship, recognized it as British, and made for it instantly. As they neared, a second ship was spotted, and then a third. Ugh! Decatur turned to escape the trap, but it was already too late. The three British ships, the Amphion, the Nymph, and the Sloop Pomona, closed in. It was soon clear that the Royal Lewis had two choices, to surrender or to be sunk. The Royal Lewis lowered its flag. It had surrendered, and its crew were now prisoners. Oh, no, Fortin was terrified. He had heard the stories of the British sending captured Africans to the West Indies to be sold into slavery. But you know, guys, he's been free. He, he was always free. He knew the Pomona had sailed back and forth from the colonies to the island of Barbados, where many Africans already languished in bondage. It was a time for dread. James was taken aboard the Amphion with others from his crew. On board the British ship, Captain Beasley inspected the prisoners. There were several boys among the American crew, and he separated them from the older men. Captain Beasley's son looked over the boys who had been captured. Many of them were younger than he was. Although still prisoners, the boys were given more freedom than the men, and Beasley's son saw the Americans playing marbles. He joined in the game. And it was during this playing that he befriended Fortin. 
The result of this tentative friendship was that Captain Beasley did not, as he might have done, send Fortin to a ship bound for the West Indies and slavery. Instead, he was treated as a regular prisoner of war and sent to the prison ship, the Jersey. So thank goodness that kids could be kids, kids and, and have a relationship where it's like, hey, the adults recognize that this is war and these kids are too young really to be fighting. Okay, quick peek at the words and then I'll have to, I'm sorry, it's blurry, it's going to refocus. Well, and we can kind of look at this. Now, this is a rough existence as a prisoner. Dark and forbidding, the Jersey was a 60-gunner anchored off Long Island in New York. It had been too old to use in the war and had been refitted first as a hospital ship and then as a ship for prisoners. The portholes had been sealed and 20-inch squares carved into her sides. Across these square squares, iron bars were placed. The captain of the Jersey greeted the prisoners with a sneer. All were searched under the watchful eyes of British Marines. The wounded were unattended, the sick ignored. The pitiful cries of other prisoners came from below decks. A few pale, sickly prisoners, covered with sores, were huddled around a water cask. Then came the cry that some would hear for months, others for years. Down, rebels, down! They were rebels against the king, to be despised, perhaps to be hanged. Traitors, they were being called, not soldiers of America. James was pushed into a line on deck. The line shuffled toward the water cask, where each man could fill a canteen with a pint of water. Then they were pushed roughly below decks. The hold of the ship was dark. What little light there was came from the small squares along the hull. The air was dank as men relieved themselves where they lay. Some of the prisoners were moaning. Others manned pumps to remove the water from the bottom of the boat. Sleep was hard coming, and James wasn't sure if he wouldn't still be sold into slavery. Beasley's son had liked him, he remembered, and the boy had offered to persuade his father to take James to England. It would have been better than the hold of the Jersey. In the morning, the first thing the crew did was to check to see how many prisoners had died during the night. Many of the prisoners were sick with yellow fever. For these, death would be just a matter of time. Fortin later claimed that the game of marbles with Beasley's son had saved him from a life of slavery in the West Indies. But on November 1st, two weeks after the capture of the Royal Lewis, the news reached New York that Brigadier General Charles Cornwallis, commander of the British Army in Virginia, had surrendered to George Washington. Washington had strongly protested the British practice of sending prisoners to the West Indies. It was probably the news of this victory, more than the game of marbles, that saved the young sailor. James Fortin was not a hero. He did not single-handedly defeat the British or sink a ship, but he fought like so many other Africans for the freedom of America, and he fought well. He was only one of thousands of Africans who helped to create the country known as the United States of America. In Philadelphia, after the war, James Fortin became an apprentice to the man his father had worked for, Robert Bridges. Like his father, James was a hard worker. Eventually, he would run the business for Robert Bridges, and by 1798, he owned it. At its height, the business employed 40 workers, both black and white. Fortin became one of the wealthiest men in Philadelphia. He married and raised a family, passing on to them the values of hard work he had learned from his father. Fortin made several major contributions to the sail-making business, among them a method of handling the huge sails in a shop 
which allowed sails to be repaired much faster and save precious time for ship owners. In the coming years, he would use his great wealth to support both anti-slavery groups and the right of women to vote. At, at a time when over 90% of all Africans in America were still in a state of enslavement. James Fortin became one of the most influential of the American, I'm sorry, James Fortin became one of the most influential of the African abolitionists. <clears throat> he spent much of his life pleading for the freedom of his people in the country his people had helped to create. There you go. Isn't that a great story? And then there are some post story questions right here. Sorry, it's a little blurry. It just needs to refocus. And um, and so really just a, a terrific story to give you yet another perspective on the Revolutionary War. Back at the beginning of this story, there is a short section. So um, if you, I know you guys probably don't have it, but it includes the, what would be the vocabulary words. And it has some great pictures. So I thought I would read this as kind of a little addendum or a bonus. And I just wanted to make sure I had time for the other story. So this is a little section called Fighting for Freedom. Many African Americans played important roles in the American Revolution. Some, like James Fortin, a sailmaker from Philadelphia, fought at sea. Others served as soldiers or spies or smuggled food through British lines. In all, more than 5,000 black soldiers, both free and enslaved men, risked their lives for America's independence. Many fought to gain their own freedom as well. This painting is widely believed to be a portrait of James Fortin. Birth, death, 1766 to 1842. After the Revolution, Fortin was influential in the fight to free slaves, had influence, helped a great deal. At the bottom, this Philadelphia school, which James Fortin attended, was founded by Quakers, who were abolitionists, people who were against slavery. They wanted to abolish, look at the base there, base word. They wanted to get rid of slavery and assisted African Americans in getting an education and finding good jobs. And I don't know about everybody out there, but my students, we've talked about why the 13 colonies were founded and who founded them and why. And so uh, Pennsylvania, by William Penn, Pennsylvania, and, um, and the Quakers. And so that is one of those ties that connects this all together. Hundreds of African-American men served in the Continental Navy. The sailor in this 1779 portrait may have been on the crew of a privateer. A privateer is a private ship, use, ship used in naval conflict, just like the Royal Lewis was. James Fortin also served on a privateer. And finally, these are just such cool pictures. By 1778, Rhode Island and Massachusetts each had an African-American army unit. The Patriot leader, John Hancock, presented this flag to the Massachusetts troop in honor of its bravery. So um, John Hancock is going to be someone that we've been reading about in our Paul Revere story. And, uh, and then the next story, if I have time, I don't know, it's a super long one, and I may not be able to read the whole thing. I might have to do two parts, but it's the story of Paul Revere. Uh, and then what happened, Paul Revere? And so that's the next one, the last one. Anyway, I hope this has been enjoyable. And uh, back to the beginning for the end. And if you guys haven't followed me yet, become a subscriber. Um, and you can see usually math, mostly math. But every now and then, I love to read. So I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye.